my pleasure to be here to, to present to you the ultimate proof of creation. And that's not just hype. I believe that there is an ultimate proof for creation, and I'm going to present that to you today. And that alone ought to be worth the price of admission, don't you think? An argument that you can't refute, an argument that uh, for the biblical creation worldview that is irrefutable. And uh, when you present this argument to people, however, I have to warn you about something. Because a lot of people think, well, if it's an ultimate proof, then when I present it, the person ought to convert right there. But the fact is, people don't always, um, people are not always convinced, even by a very good argument. Isn't that right? And uh, people sometimes are convinced by a very bad argument. That's what logical fallacies are. They're bad arguments that people tend to find convincing. So I can't promise you that this argument will necessarily persuade people because there is a difference between proof and persuasion. Just because an argument doesn't persuade doesn't mean it's not a very good argument. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the argument. It means there's something wrong with people. People are not always completely rational. But you see, it's not our job, really, to persuade people. Our job is to give a defense, to make an argument for the Christian worldview. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. And I can guarantee you this. There will be no rational comeback from this argument. It is absolutely irrefutable. Now, it's a, kind of a different way of thinking than maybe some of you are used to. But the fact that it's irrefutable ought to, ought to prompt you to study this and uh, learn this particular method of defending the faith. I'd like to start with some, um, some evidence that is commonly used to confirm creation. And I think, th I think this is very good evidence. I'd like to start with information science. Dr. Werner Gitt, one of the world's experts on information science, says there is no law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. So that, that sort of makes sense. You pick up a book, it's got information in it, it's got these encoded symbolic messages in there that convey an expected action and an intended purpose. And uh, that doesn't come about by an explosion in a typewriter, does it? You know, when you read a book, it, it, it didn't come about by a random uh, process. It doesn't generate by itself, information doesn't generate by itself in matter. In fact, Dr. Gitz says, when its progress along the chain of transmission events is traced backwards, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. So although information can be copied, and it can be copied blindly, a Xerox machine can make copies of information, if you trace it back, it ultimately comes to a mind, the mind of the sender. That sort of makes sense. You read a book, you know it has an, an author. And that's also very interesting because, of course, in DNA we have information. And all that information are the instructions that make you, your physical form, and perhaps even some of your uh, personality traits and so on and so forth. And the reason you're a person and not a cabbage is you have instructions to make a person, and a cabbage has instructions to make a cabbage. And that's a lot of instructions. Of course, some of those are the same anyway, because we have some of the same biochemical pathways. But the fact that we have information in our DNA tells us that DNA could not have come about by a random chance process. That information has been copied many times. You got it from your parents. They got it from their parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And then it came from a mind, the mind of God. So information science confirms creation. Mutations won't do it. Dr. Lee Spetner, PhD biophysicist, says that all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. Mutations do not add brand new instructions. He says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Now, mutations may increase survival value under certain circumstances. That's fine. But they don't add brand new information to the genome. They don't do that. It would violate the laws of information science. Information science, genetics, they confirm biblical creation. And they're not what we'd expect given the evolutionary worldview. So I think that's a great confirmation of, of creation. We could talk about the biblical time scale and the fact that we find C14 in diamonds. And uh, Dr. Snelling talked about that the other night. I think that's a really powerful confirmation of a young earth because C14 does not last even one million years. If the entire Earth were C14 in one million years, it would be gone. It would have decayed into nitrogen. I didn't even believe that calculation until I did it myself. It's true. It, 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 C14 just doesn't last that long. And so the fact that we find it in diamonds that are supposed to be billions of years old tells us those diamonds are not billions of years old. They're thousands of years old. In fact, it limits the age at a few, a few thousand years. And that, of course, the 58,000 there is an upper limit. It could be much younger than that. So carbon, it, or C14 in diamonds, and pretty much everything we find in the earth, anything that has carbon in it has C14 in it, it appears. And that certainly confirms recent creation and a global flood uh, in, in the geologically recent past, not millions of years ago. We could move out into space, talk about 
comets, the fact that comets are made up of ice and dirt and they orbit the sun, and every time they orbit, they lose a little bit of material. As the sun blasts away that icy material, it's what forms a comet's tail. Of course, we looked at some of those uh, yesterday, those of you that attended my astronomy talk. So comets just don't last that long. They run out of material in about 100,000 years. And I've seen comets be destroyed in one pass as they go behind the sun. I used to have access to the SOHO spacecraft, and it would watch for comets, and among other things. And sometimes they would be destroyed in one pass. They do not last that long. And so if the solar system really were 4.5 billion years old, why do we still have comets? Now, I think these are amazing lines of evidence, don't you? I mean, they're pretty powerful confirmations of biblical creation. But they really don't constitute an ultimate proof. I mean, it may seem like I've refuted the evolutionary worldview, that I've absolutely demonstrated creation, but I haven't. And the reason is, for every one of these lines of evidence that I've presented to you, an evolutionist can always come up with what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a conjecture designed to protect his worldview from what appears to be contrary evidence. So in the case of comets, for example, my secular astronomy friends, they know that, uh, they know that comets don't last that long. But they say, well, but the we know the solar system is billions of years old, so there must be some source of new comets, which they call an Oort cloud after its inventor, Jan Oort. And so the idea is there's this vast sphere of potential comets way beyond the planets, beyond where we can detect it. And every now and then, one of these is thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. So as the old ones are depleted, new ones replace them. That's kind of convenient. So you see the solar system can be billions of years old after all. Now, if I were to ask a secular astronomer, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, well, no, but you can't prove it's not there, right? And that's true. I can't prove that there's not Nort clouds. It's very hard to disprove something that can't be detected in any way. So, so yeah, I mean, that's true. And, and therefore, there could be an Oort cloud. And therefore, comets don't prove that the solar system's thousands of years old. They confirm it, but they don't prove it. And if you think about it, an evolutionist can always invoke a rescuing device because there are always unknowns. We don't know everything. And there are always unknowns in science, and therefore the evolutionists can always invoke a rescuing device. And by the way, so can you. I might ask you a question that you don't immediately know the answer to. You'll come up with a rescuing device. You're not ready to just give up your worldview on the basis of one uns little unsolved mystery there. And so uh, I can't really blame my evolutionary colleagues for inventing the rescuing devices. I'm not blaming the secular astronomer necessarily for thinking there's an Oort cloud. That is consistent with his observation that there are comets and his worldview, his belief that the solar system is billions of years old. So he's thinking in a way that is consistent with his worldview. On the other hand, I don't necessarily believe in an Oort cloud. I don't have any reason to. I look at comets and I say, yeah, that's what I'd expect because I start with a different worldview, a different way of thinking about things. If you think about it, Creationists and evolutionists really all have the same facts, don't we? I mean, I have access to the same DNA patterns. I have access to the same fossils, the same stars and galaxies as my evolutionary colleagues. We have the same facts, the same physical evidence, as it were. We have the same science. I use physics and chemistry and astronomy. My secular colleagues use physics, chemistry, and astronomy. We have the same science. Why then do we draw such different conclusions about the past? And the answer is we have a different starting point, a different worldview a different way of thinking about things, which you can liken unto mental glasses. Those of you that wear glasses, you know that if you have those off, the world looks fuzzy. You put those glasses on, the world snaps into focus, and you see things as they are. And I like to think of the Bible like corrective lenses. You think, you think about things from the perspective of biblical history, you see the world as it is. I like to think of evolution like uh, red glasses. You put on red glasses, the world looks red. Not that the world is red, but that's what you see, because you see it's biased because of your... Uh, your, the glasses you're wearing. Now, I realize, of course, evolutionists will say, oh, no, we're the ones wearing the corrective lenses. You're the ones wearing the red glasses. And we're going to have to argue for that. My point here is simply that we all wear mental glasses. We all have a worldview. We all come to the evidence with, uh, with certain preconceptions, with certain beliefs about how that evidence should be interpreted. Now, some people might say, oh, no, not me. I don't have a worldview. I, come to the I believe we ought to come to the evidence neutrally and objectively. Well, guess what? That is a belief about how to interpret evidence. See, the philosophy that we should come to evidence without a philosophy is itself a philosophy. <laughs> it's just a very bad one because it's self-refuting. Your worldview is all of your most basic beliefs about reality, which we call presuppositions. Presuppositions, your most basic beliefs about the universe, about how we know what we know, and so on and so forth. They are the rules of interpretation that we assume at the outset before any investigation.